So we've been talking about being a successful Christian and um, leaving our problems at the cross, I think, is probably one of the areas that um, is most difficult for you and I being Christians. You know, we say we have faith, and we do, but sometimes it's just from time to time. Sometimes we have faith, but it wanes. Sometimes we have faith, and things happen beyond what we even imagined, and we don't know why or how to handle what's going on. So today I want to talk about leaving our problems at the cross. God is good all the time, but not just because it's a saying, not just because it sounds good. No, it's because all that God has done from the beginning of time until today, this very moment, he's always working for the good of his children. He heals the brokenhearted. It says that in Psalm um, 34, I think. He heals the brokenhearted. Um, he provides peace to those who seek him and rest in him. Jesus said in Matthew eleven twenty eight, 28, come to me, all of you who are burdened, heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Now we know the scripture, but if I were to be asking you a question seriously today, I would say, how, how successful have you been at leaving your problems at the cross? How successful have you been at taking the problem that you have the burden, whatever it is, and giving it to God and then just walking away not thinking about it. And I got to say, more than likely, you've not been very successful. Why? Because you're human. And we have a tendency to want to come to um, terms with the problem. In other words, we want a solution. And we want it now. We want it today. So I thought we would talk about how do we actually lay our burdens at the cross. It sounds easy, so there must be a formula. No, there's no formulas in Scripture. Uh, but there must be a process to laying things down at the cross because with Christ, everything is a process. Do you know we become sanctified? It's an ongoing process, becoming more and more like Christ. Some of us, I've been saved 40 years, some of you more, some of you less, and we're all on a journey. And on that journey, we don't reach perfection. You're not going to reach perfection. You're gonna, not going to get to the place where you're like, yep, I got it all together. I'm just like Pastor Mike. No, you're, you're not going to get to that place. That went right over your head. That's okay. That's good. You're not going to get to that place where you are fully perfected in Christ. Why? Because in this world, we have outside forces, enemy, distractions, and we have all the pressures of life coming down to bear upon us. Jesus lived for 33 years. He knows the burdens that we struggle with. And that's why he said, come unto me, all of you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. The amazing thing, though, about being human is that we can say at one moment in time, yep, I gave that problem to God. And not 10 minutes later, or an hour later, or whatever it is, but sometime soon, shortly after that, we're going to find ourselves beginning to think about how do I solve that problem? What else can I do? Maybe if I, maybe if I fast more. Maybe if I study more. Maybe, maybe... Ah, I gotta do, there's gotta be something I have to do because that's human nature. We feel like we need to do more. That's why a lot of people have tr trouble with becoming a Christian because they can't get it through their head. They know how bad they are, they know how inherently evil we are as human beings. They know the thoughts, we all live them. And for us to say, well, God covers all of that. All we have to do is believe on Jesus. It's so easy that we just can't accept it. We just can't accept the fact that a holy, righteous God covers all of our problems for us. All we have to do is just say yes to Jesus. See, all of this, believing in Jesus, believing how to lay your burdens down, all of this has to do with our humanity. 
And since Jesus was a man, he died on a tree as man. He laid aside his deity. Think about that for a moment. All of this we struggle with today, but there is a solution. And the solution is learning how to get to the place where we can lay it all at the foot of Christ. Now, how does it start? So to lay down your burden completely means dropping it off and letting go. Now, those of you who have children, okay, uh, when... Uh, come on now, I didn't say anything yet. Those of you who have children, you know, when the baby's first born, the first time you drop it off or a babysitter comes, you're like calling every hour, how's the baby, is the baby okay, you know. When the kid is one year old, you're like, here, see ya, I'll call you later, you know. You're like out the door, gone, you know, you don't even call the babysitter one time. You're just like, I'm looking for space. I'm letting go. Why? Because you laid down the burden and you forgot about it, at least for a couple of hours. That's what it means to lay down the burden at the cross of Christ. It means that thing is creeping me out, no matter even if it's covered or not. It's just Laying it down at the foot of Christ, whatever burden, whatever problem, whatever trial you're going through, means you're going to give it to him, and then you are not going to return back to the problem. You're not going to call. You're not going to start, well, maybe if I pray more. Maybe if I, you're not going to do anything except believe God. Trust in God. And God, believe it or not, is very excited when we do that. Because it shows what? It shows we trust him. Shows we trust him. It's kind of like having a friend. When you begin to trust, relationship builds and goes deeper. Amen? Now, at least with me, I find many times that learning to do something new, and I hope what you're learning today, for some of you, might be brand new, but it is new because we really don't know how to leave our problems at the cross. So, me, I've made many errors over the years. Am I completely successful at leaving problems at the cross? No. I'd be lying to you if I said I was. But I'm much more successful at it today than I was before, even just a few years ago. See, I'm stubborn, I'm self-willed, and I don't like to give up control. And I know none of you are like that, right? No. No. <laughs> No, none of you are like that, Joe or anybody else. No, none of you are like that. Just me. Um, but in hopes that you're all just lying and you're just like me, um, I'd like to give you some personal scriptural advice. Personal because I've lived it. Scriptural because that's the only thing that can help you. My advice can't help you. But my experience in how scripture applied in my life helped me, it can help you. So before we get to that, did you know, first of all, okay, uh, I don't know how I skipped that. I got it. I think this is working. But did you know that having the Holy Spirit is better than having Jesus present with you at the moment? Now, some of you are going to start to get, what? What's he talking about, man? That sounds weird. Don't get nervous. Don't get nervous. Jesus said this. He said, nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. We have the Holy Spirit. God sent his helper, one part of the Godhead, the Holy Spirit, to us. If it wasn't necessary to have the Holy Spirit, why would God send them to us? It was necessary. So it's necessary for us that we understand the power and the presence, the significance and the importance of the Holy Spirit. Jesus was confined to a body when he was here on earth. In other words, he couldn't be in more than one place at one time. Why? Because he laid aside his deity. He was man. But the Spirit was able to reach and touch every single one of them at any time, 
anywhere in the world. So when Paul was in Asia or wherever, and and Matthew was here, and, and John was here, the Holy Spirit was available to them, just as he is to us today. In this little place, Old Lyme, you look on the map of the world like you can't even find it. But yet God's available to us today. See, the Spirit, His Spirit is with us, and He's in us. And if we know Jesus as Savior, he helps us walk out our daily life. Every problem, every situation, he is concerned with. Now, for me, my best friend in the whole world is my wife. You know, we've talked about things, we've laughed about things, uh, we've been angry about things. We've gone through it all. We love each other in sickness, in health, um, good times, bad times. We've been with each other. We, we've proven a commitment to each other. But as great as my relationship is with my wife, there is one better. There's one better for her and there's one better for me. That is our independent relationship with Jesus. See, it's the relationship that I and that she has with God through the Holy Spirit that strengthens each of us independently that allows us to come together corporately to do the things that we're able to do. The Spirit is always with me. No matter where I go, no matter what happens in life or death, okay, if I leave this earth tomorrow, the Spirit of God is still with my wife. If she leaves, the Spirit of God is still with me. And it's amazing for me, and it's a comfort for me, to know that I have a friend even closer than my wife. Think about that for just a minute. In John uh, chapter 15, verse 15, it says this. It says, No longer do I call you servants, for a servant does not know what the master is doing. But I have called you friends. For all that I have heard from my Father, I've made known to you. Can you imagine God actually calls us friend? Think of, just really think about that for a minute. Think about a friend you have. And, and try to really imagine, is Jesus my friend like he or she is my friend? Because He wants to be. He wants to be. The relationship with God is so special and so unique, and you'll never grow out of it. You'll never grow out of your relationship. You'll never mature out of your friendship. You know, you hear people, well, I just fell out of love. Whatever. You're not going to do that with God. God will never leave you and never forsake you. Now, you may turn your back on him. You may decide to get angry at God for a season, but God isn't going anywhere. He isn't. And the moment you say, Lord, forgive me, right back, right back in good graces. Story of the prodigal son is the best story about that. David said this in Psalm 139, verse 7. Where shall I go from? Where shall I go from your spirit? Where where can I flee to to get away from your presence? Nowhere. You can't get away from the presence of God. You can't escape him. He promised to never leave you. Ain't no mountain high enough. You know, right? You know the song, right? Ain't no river wide enough, you know? The song is great, but nothing's better than Jesus, man. It's much better than that. He's better than the song. He's better than any words you can write about. Because you cannot get away from him. And just as God the Father delights in his children, the Spirit of God delights in hearing from us. He wants to hear from you. He listens to our problems, our challenges, our prayers. He even listens to our questions, our anger, and our doubts. He listens. Listen. Put aside the scripture for a moment. I'm not going to teach on it because it takes too long. About grieving the Holy Spirit. Please just get that out of your mind. I, I want to tell you, it is, 
The Holy Spirit is not some little wimpy, you know, oh my God, you hurt my feelings, okay? That is not the Holy Spirit. It is the furthest thing from the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit does not get grieved easily, even though Scripture says he's easily grieved. Because the word easily there, it doesn't relate to our culture today. It's not the same word. If you try to translate it into English, it is not. Our culture is easily, easily offended. You could say the wrong, I call you he. Oh my God, you call me he. I identify as a they. And they get offended. The Holy Spirit is not like that. You could say it, even though you didn't mean it, when you're talking about him, the Holy Spirit. He's not going to be offended. Trust me. The word offended there means something that is purposely aimed at the Holy Spirit. He's easily grieved when we are aiming at him or we surround ourselves with people who are alienated to the presence of the Holy Spirit. But if you are centered in Christ and you love the Lord, let me tell you something. The Holy Spirit desires to have a deep and intimate and close relationship with you. Now, this is how we experience God. Because you need to learn how to experience him in order to give him your burdens because it involves trust and faith. The minute you meet a new person, okay, don't tell me you just trust them. Hey, want to watch my kids this afternoon? <laughs> you just met the person for the first time. Hey, want to watch my kids today? Hey, here they are. Take them. <laughs> uh, do you start telling them your most deep, intimate, private thoughts do you start telling them the secrets that most people in life don't know? No. How, how does that progress? How do you get to that place where you have a close friend that you're willing to say, hey, man, I'm, I'm struggling with, can we talk? It takes time. It takes time. When I first got saved over 40 years ago, I could tell you, I thought that I was like friends with Jesus. But many years later, as I looked back, I realized, wow, what a dummy, you know? I wasn't, I, I was trying to hide things from God. You can't hide things from God. You, you can't hide anything from God. You know, we shut the lights off when we want to do things we don't want to, you know, we shut the lights off. God can see in the dark. Hello. <laughs> Hello, he knows your every thought. When you're close with someone, you're not ashamed anymore. You don't have to go into the dark places to do things. It's in the light. It's in the open. Just as it took time to build a deep, intimate, close relationship with a friend... It takes time to build a deep, intimate, close relationship with God. But the benefits are so much greater. The benefits, because he will never leave you. He will never forsake you. But it all starts off the same way. Building trust slowly in the little things. Like you get a headache. And, and just, just an example, okay? Okay, please. Don't come to me later and go, well, I took an aspirin this week, and you said, just please, just chill out, okay? But in the little things, like you get a headache, instead of running to the aspirin or the Excedrin, try trusting God. Well, I don't know. Look, if you can't trust God with a headache, you're going to trust him with your 16-year-old daughter? Huh? Hello? Hello? You're going to trust him with the big bill that just came in? No, you're not going to. Not possible. Try trusting God. I can tell you this. You'll never be disappointed. Because God will meet you right where you are. If he knows you're trusting him for the first time with your headache, and, and this is the one thing about God that re really bugs me, because, you know, you get a new Christian, and you're like, yeah, man, I trusted God. I had a headache, and, like, God just took it away. It was like, great. Me, I'm like, pounding headache, you know? I'm like, no, I'm not going to take any aspirin. Two days later, pounding headache, you know, it's still going on. I, sometimes God's trying to say, you know, there's no formula. I'm looking at your heart. So when you're a new Christian, God's got a lot of grace. 
When you're first trying to trust God, he's got a lot of grace with you. He'll meet you right where you are because it's a process. He promised he'll never leave you. He promised he'll never forsake you. But it starts here, knowing who God is. Do you know who God is? Now, if I ask you who God is, um, I don't want to hear some pat answer. Because if I ask you who, if you're married, if I ask you who your spouse is, you could tell me some good things, deep things. Nothing bad, but you know what I mean. You could tell me deep things about your spouse. Tell me who God is to you. Tell me if you know God's intentions for you. A lot of Christians know what the Bible says, but do you really know what God's intentions are for you? Because his intentions are always good. Always. Even if it looks like hell on earth. His intentions are still good for you. But why am I going through hell? Ha ha. That's the 24 karat question. Why? Let's see. Does it have to do with God because? Or does it have to do with me because? Chances are it's me. <laughs> why? Because I'm the one that's got to learn the lesson. Chances are I'm going through hell because of me, not because of him. You hear me? Because I don't really know who he is, and I don't understand God's intentions toward me, towards me. But yet these are foundational. This is foundational to leaving your burdens at the tree. It's foundational to get into the place where you can surrender control. Hello, all you control freaks out there. Come on, I know I'm not the only one. Come on, you know. Come on, you know. You like control. You want to determine the outcome. Yes, amen. Who said that? I like that. Good. Amen. Most of us do. But yet, God says, I want you to surrender control to me. I, I mean... It sounds so simple, but how impossible is that for many of you? Really impossible, right? It's like the first time your kid asks you to take them driving. I mean, me, I was like, uh, Bill's driving school. Call the phone number and get the guy on the phone. <laughs> There's no way I'm taking you out driving, okay? Why? Because I don't trust you. <laughs> That's why. I don't even trust some of you. No. <laughs> I know, I know, I know. It's coming back to me. I don't want to hear it. But <laughs> See, surrendering control is huge. But I could tell you, in many instances, I've gotten to the place where I could surrender control. I'm like, oh, man, success. But that's not the end. There's always having patience in waiting for the result, the answer. Now, granted, none of these four things are easy to do. But starting with number one, can you say without a doubt that you know who God is? Okay, I can go home. We can all go home right now and just stop right there. Because this is probably, question number one is probably three months of teaching. Honestly, I'm being completely candid with you. I actually thought about breaking this down. And I went, oh my God, it's like a whole year. <laughs> it's like these four things will take a whole year. But for the sake of expediency and the presence of the Holy Spirit bringing to recall the things that you need, you could speed that process up very, very quickly. See, maybe some of you do know who Jesus is, who God is. But once you know who he is, and once you know God's intentions towards you, your whole life will change. It just will. It will shift. The way you view other people will change. Your patience level will change. Not because you want it to, but because the revelation of who he is the revelation of his intentions towards you, it will change you. 
beyond the, a doubt. But it doesn't end there, like I said, because we get to the final. We think the end. I've surrendered control. Wow, I'm there. But then we have to patiently wait the outcome. And knowing that whatever the outcome is, I have to be satisfied with it. I don't want that kind of answer. (laughs) I want the answer to the question I want, and I want the answer now. Praise God. Right? See, just admit it, because that's who most of us are. I can't wait months for you to answer me, God. But guess what? You end up waiting months. (laughs) So all this takes time. And yet, with each new challenge, each new burden, each new situation that arises in your life, over life, over time, every single new challenge will take a new revelation of who God is. Because each circumstance shows a different part of God in your life and how God is working in your life. So what I want to give you today are some practical steps um, If you saw the movie, What About Bob? (laughs) Baby steps, okay? Baby steps. And that's kind of what these are. And I'm not being, I, I don't mean to be insulting at all. Honestly, I'm just being extremely serious. But if you use this and take baby steps, what you'll find is revelation at the end of the tunnel. God's there. Number one, let's go. Talk to God about your problem. Sounds really simple. What does it mean to talk to God? Well, that's a form of prayer, talking to God. As Christians, the first person we should communicate our problems to, or we should communicate with, it should be God. It just, that should be the place we go. Not man. Your friend may listen to you if he's patient like Pastor Dave. If he's like me, he may listen, but his foot is slowly trying to make it to the door. (laughs) You already know that about me, so I'm not revealing anything new. Um, There's nobody as patient as God. And he's the one we should pour out to. See, but most of us prefer to share with a friend first. Why? Because misery loves company. We just want someone else to share in all the garbage we're going through. We want to dump on someone else. But we need to remember, God is more interested in our peace than any friend you might have on earth. And that's not insulting any of your friends whatsoever. It's just a matter of fact. It's the truth. When you're burdened, the first thing you should do is talk to the Holy Spirit about your problem. He sincerely wants to hear you talk. And I could tell you from experience, many times in my regurgitating my problem, talking about the situation, in the midst of me communicating, God will give me the peace. Sometimes he'll give me an answer if it's not so big of a problem. Just in communicating. When we pour out everything before him, In time, we find that it's easier and easier to talk with him. It it becomes, if it becomes your first step, the first thing that you do, over time, the worries and the problems and the burdens that you're struggling with, what you'll find is no longer will you be talking to God about the little stuff. Because why? Because you've already learned to lay it at the feet of Jesus. You, you just, just by practicing talking, you'll learn, okay, let me, let me talk to you about the big stuff. Let me talk to you. Well, this, yeah, this will take care. You, you begin, faith begins to build. Why? Because communicating with God, God is created. Who, who are we created in whose image? We're created in his image. We are created in the image and likeness of God. We are like him. Now, some of you, he doesn't like to talk as much as you do. (laughs) But when he talks, hopefully you listen. 
But the idea is God is a good listener. He will allow you to pour out everything that's troubling you. Everything that's on your heart, your mind, yours, everything. He'll allow you to pour it all out. Because he delights in that. He already knows the answer. He already knows the solution. He already knows the end from the beginning. But yet he likes that communication. Just like a little child. When they come to you with their big, big problems. And we're looking at it going, you know, kid, that's not a problem. But listen, to them it is. But they want what? They want to just tell us. Well, daddy, I got, I got. They want to tell. And so we have to be what? Good listeners. God is a good listener. And in the process of speaking and telling God your problems, you're learning, listen, you're learning to trust him. And the more you begin to share with him, the more you begin to tell him, the more your trust begins to get built. And in the process of building trust, you'll find God starts to release things to you automatically into your life. I remember going through some difficult problems in my past, in my life, and there were times when I could not sleep. Now, we've all experienced that from time to time, but because of something you were consumed with, problem in your life, right? You just, no matter what you did, when you laid down to go to sleep, it's like, it's just your mind is running like 900 miles an hour, trying to think of every possible scenario. I was like that with everything. I, I just couldn't help it because I, I was such a control. I am. I, I was. I, I still am. So I am a control freak. Okay. All right. Okay. <laughs> I'm working on it. You know that. You know I'm working on it. Okay. All right. So because I am still kind of a control. I am a control freak. So the more I share and the more I release unto God, the more I was able to at night put my head down on the pillow and say, Lord, I don't know how, but I give it to you and I trust you. And I find myself sleeping through the night. I remember one time I was in such fear about situations happening in my life. I literally, and this is hard for me to admit, but it's absolutely the truth. I was 30-something years old, fairly, fairly strong, a lot better looking, still the same hair. But I've, I found myself literally hiding under the bed. Because the door, somebody would ring the doorbell, I, I hid under the bed. That's fear. I couldn't sleep at night. That's fear. My wife will tell you this. I don't care what's going on in my life right now. 99 out of 100 nights, I put my head on that pillow, and I'm going to bed, baby. Give me 8 to 10 hours. Every single night because I need my beauty sleep and God gives it to me. Hallelujah. Because <laughs> he knows I need my beauty sleep. So talking to God about your problem is not just like talking to your friend. And when you leave your friend, you feel what? You feel sometimes you feel a little better because you're able to share. But about an hour later, it, nothing's changed. Because your friend can only be a good ear, but God is the God of all the universe. And he's already working on solutions and situations to your problem. The moment you begin to share, he's already started working on it. Before you even thought of praying to God, he already was working on your problems. That's what scripture says. Number two, talk to God. Number two, meditate on scriptures. Now, scriptures are a help. Psalm 119 talks about how burdens are lifted when we read scripture and when we meditate and when we pray. Psalm 119, 105 says, Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Think about that for a minute. Think about what it means. A lamp to my feet. You ever walk in the dark? This is like talk, talking about walking in the midst of a deep, dark problem in your life. Something that's going on in your life that you have absolutely no control over and it's overwhelming you. His word is a lamp to our feet and a light to our path. So not only do we know where we're stepping, but we know where we're going. I think it's powerful. That's what scripture is. Scripture is what? The word of God. Jesus is called, what's one of his names? The word of God. 
He's alive. And Scripture comes alive. Get into the Scriptures. Look for Bible verses that specifically deal with your problem or your issue. If you need to, write them down. Put them on an index card. Speak them out loud. Declare them. You sound crazy. I know. This sounds crazy. I don't care because I lived it. I'm telling you, it works. I don't care if people think I'm crazy because I know it works. <clears throat> Hebrews 4.12 says, For the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of the soul and the spirit, of the joints and the marrow, discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. Now, they use some pretty descriptive terminology there. Sharper than any two-edged sword. And you read that to a person who's from a place like Japan, where they're known for the making of samurai swords, made with a steel that is only done through a special t kind of tempering. You talk about sharper than any... Th their first question is, how is that possible? That, that's what it is. How is that? Because they know the work that goes into a two-edged sword. It says piercing even to the division of the soul and the spirit. We, we can't see the soul. We can't see the spirit. The joints and the marrow. Did you ever try to did you ever get a bone and, and you, you try to cut a bone? You need something really sharp. And then you look on the inside of the marrow. It, this says it could divide the bone from the marrow and the joints from the bone. God's word is so powerful, it can divide the truth from a lie in a split second. And what is the devil constantly doing to us when we're going through a problem? He's lying. It's just like fake media. They lie every day about everything the same way. Every day to convince you of their lie. That's coming to an end soon, by the way, but, but God. So the word of God is in a category all by itself. Nothing ever written even comes close to the Bible because nothing ever written is alive and active like the word of God. So the sword is like a surgical instrument. It heals as it pierces, as it penetrates and cuts out even the most malignant kind of cancer. That's how powerful it is. Psalm 1911 says, By them, the word of God, is your servant warned. In keeping them, there is great reward. By scripture, we're warned. And by keeping scripture, we are rewarded. There's something about the living word of God. It, it, the last part of that scripture verse says it judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. You, you and I, we don't know the thoughts and the attitudes of someone's heart, but the word of God does. That's good news. We don't have to judge the thoughts and the attitudes of our own hearts. When we're unsure if we're really trusting God, God, I don't, you know, I feel like I trust you, but I'm not sure. You ever get there? I don't, I don't, I don't know. I'm not sure. One of the movies I just saw recently, a guy was asked, he was actually a good guy, but he, he did a lot of bad deeds, but for good purposes. <clears throat> and so a doctor, because he got wounded, a doctor came to him and says, I need to ask you a question. He said, are you a good man or are you a bad man? And I was like, I don't know, God. I, I don't, I don't, I'm thinking to myself, I don't know if somebody asked me that question. And, and a little bit later on in the movie, the old man who asked the question, he, he said, um, the other guy said, why did you ask me that question? He said, your answer to me was I don't know. He said, only a good man would say I don't know. And I thought about that, and I said, you know, God, there's truth in that, because I don't know. No, <laughs> but, but there is. There's truth in that. Astonishingly enough, life-generating things happen with the Word of God, because the Word of God is able and capable in and of itself to accomplish great things. Isaiah 55, 11 says, The rain and the snow come down from the heavens and stay on the ground to water the earth. 
They cause the grain to grow, producing seed for the farmer and bread for the hungry. It's the same with my word. This is God speaking. I send it out, and it always produces fruit. It will accomplish all I want it to do, and it will prosper everywhere that I send it. That's God's word. Acts 2, 41, on the day of Pentecost, when Peter preached the message of salvation in Christ, those who heard it, listen, were cut to the heart. Sword, piercing heart. Cut to the heart. And about 3,000 people were saved. Maybe you've never experienced this. Some of you are good at evangelizing. Hopefully you have. I've experienced it. You know, you try telling people about Jesus. You try giving them, you know, all your head knowledge and, and all these and answer their questions. And what I found is, listen, just give them the word. I just got to shut up and give them the word of God. And it could be the most obscure scripture. It doesn't matter. One of the famous uh, evangelists uh, of the uh, 20, 20th century, and I can't remember which one it was, but anyhow, his testimony was this. There was a guy taking an old Bible, and he was tearing out verses and handing them out on the street corner. He said, I got a verse from him. That night, I gave my life to Christ. And so the audience said, what scripture did you get? And he says, in all the days of, uh, who lived the longest? Enoch? Yeah, and all the days of Enoch were 975, and he died. <laughs> I'm like, what is that? He said, I suddenly had a realization of my own mortality. <laughs> what? I mean, but that's how God works. He met him right where he was because it was alive. So the word of God is vital to us as Christians. And God in mercy and grace gave us his word. And his word is, it's a love story. It's a love story written, woven through all these beautiful verses. Meditate on the word. Number three, thank God for the answer. This is the big one. It's going to take a couple of minutes. Bear with me. i give you a couple of quick scriptures. Philippians 4, 6. Be careful for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be known to God. We don't have time to talk about this again. First of all, God already knows what you have need of before you ask. But he says, let me know what you have need of anyhow. <laughs> Why? Because he likes to make us spin our wheels? No, because he's a father that loves to hear the desires, and the heart of his children. Be careful for nothing, but by everything, by prayer and supplication and thanksgiving, make your request be made known to God. <clears throat> Mark eleven twenty four. 24, Jesus said, so I tell you to believe that you've received the things that you asked for in prayer, and I'll give them to you. <laughs> okay, Jesus, that's easy. The Bible says it is impossible to please God without faith. Okay. Hebrews eleven six. Without faith, it is impossible to please God, because anyone who comes to God must believe that he exists, and he rewards those who earnestly seek him. Just think about what that scripture says for just a moment in, in the back of your mind. He rewards those who diligently, earnestly seek him. If faith is this important, then why in the world, how in the world, what in the world do I do to live by faith? Because faith is obviously so important. How do I get there? How do I believe what I don't see? The Bible says that faith is being sure in your heart of what you do not see with your eyes. <laughs> now, faith is being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see, one translation says. Faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things we can't see. I remember in Bible school, that verse, we had to write an essay on the meaning of that verse to us. I remember, I sat in my room in my, our apartment. I sat there, on, without exaggeration, it must have been two hours, and I could not think of one thing to write. 
Not one. There was faith, substance of what I can't see, evidence of something I, 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 I don't get it. Faith is visualizing the invisible. You see it, but only in your heart. You long to see it in your natural eyes, but you have to first see it in your heart. Our problem is we get this reversed. I only believe what I see. When I see it, then I'll believe. Eh, wrong. <laughs> That's backwards. You got to believe it before you see it. So what I've learned to do, and my wife was really instrumental in helping me to learn this, I thank God in advance. Faith is not believing God can do something. Faith is not believing God will do something. Faith is believing God is doing something. We sang that song last week, you remember? God is up to something. God is up to something. There's some, yes, he is. You got to determine what he's up to. It doesn't matter by faith. What do you believe in God for? He's doing something. See, that's our human nature. But I want to know what he's doing. <laughs> I want to know who's he going to talk to. Come on, tell me God. He's not going to tell you. God is doing something right now for some of you. Right now. Even while you've been facing the wall where nothing has changed or moved at all in years. Nothing has changed. The wall is still here. God's doing something. God's doing something. Sometimes we look at it, but it's a wall. What's he going to do? Well, you could pass through the wall because he's God. He can eliminate the wall because he's God. He could take down the whole building because he's God. But we got to trust he's doing something. See, it's so much different when you're looking at a person or a situation with other people, or an obstacle in your way. Because most of us, when we have problems, it has to do with other people, right? So think how difficult and thick-headed you are. Come on, come on. You know you're thick-headed, and yes, you are. Of course you are. Now, multiply that by 10, that's how thick skulled the other people are. <laughs> and God is trying to get through to them to answer your prayer. And we want it all to happen in like a week. <laughs> or less. See, God's moving things into place now, even though we don't see it, and that's why we have to start thanking him in advance. Because every time we believe that something is happening, even though we don't see it, and we thank God, what we're doing is we're giving God the glory for the impossible. Woo, let me tell you something. That's a great place to be. Learning to accept the answer you get from God can only truly be accomplished when we trust him completely. And we know his desires for us are good, so I trust you. And by thanking him in advance, we're thanking him not for the answer that we want, but for the answer that he wants for us. Ooh, he knows what's best for us. See, a lot of times we don't get the answer to prayer because, and, and listen carefully now, don't go off. Some of you got a teaching that you misapplied, okay? We're, we're told when we ask, we need to ask specifically about things. And that's true about things you know line up with Scripture. When you're talking about other people, okay, you can't do that. Why? Because you can't do that. Nobody can even get through to your thick skull. How are they going to get through to somebody else's? See, we got, to rec we got to recognize God has to deal with many other people to answer our prayer. 
And it may not look like the answer we want is coming, but God knows what's going to be best for us, how it's going to come about. So trusting God, thanking him in advance that when, whatever the answer is, I'm thanking you for it now. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. You know, that's total relinquishment of control. Total. Because you're trusting God. That his answer, even though you only want this way, exactly, and God's going to give it to you a different way. <laughs> Fourth point. <clears throat> don't talk to anybody unless they're like-minded. I'm sorry, I don't know what else to tell you. This is the best advice. This, this, is, this is why I saved it here. Don't talk to people who are not like-minded. You're wasting your time. You're spinning your wheel. It doesn't mean you can't be with them, you can't be friends. I, I'm saying when you're believing God for something that's so impossible, don't share it with people who don't have the ability to believe like you do. Because number one, they're going to be either jealous or envious or think you're nuts. Or all three. Hello? A perfect person to share your burdens with is someone who is not just anyone, but someone who has been filled with faith more than you. Listen, more than you. Always, I always look for someone who has more faith than I do. If I have a problem, I am not going to share it with just everybody. I won't. I talk to God, and then I'm going to go to find somebody who's got more faith than me about whatever the problem is. Because why am I going to share down? <laughs> right? I'm going to share. I mean, nothing wrong with this, but, you know, if I have a monetary problem, I'm not going to go share my monetary problem with somebody living on the street. Hello. Right? Nothing against that person, but what are they going to give me? They ain't going to give me anything. Not that God can't give me. They're not going to give me anything. I'm going to go talk to people who made it. I'm going to talk to people who've been successful. I'm going to talk to people that have heard from God, got answered from God, living a successful life, doing the right thing. That goes for anything in life. I mean, you want to buy a piece of real estate, right? What are you going to go talk to? A homeless person? Are you going to talk to Robert Kioski? He owns 14,753 homes as of last week. 14,753 homes. Hello. I'm going to go talk to him. I'm going to read his books. Why? Because he knows how to do it. God, we're so stubborn. Hallelujah. See, there's something about a three-stranded cord. When you find someone who has the ability and the understanding to walk in faith and you share it with God and you, the three of you become a three-stranded cord. Scripture talks about that, Ecclesiastes 4, 12. And though one can overpower him who is alone, two can maybe resist him, but a cord of three strands is not quickly broken. Something about three. Something about three. So I want to surround myself with someone who's better, stronger, more faith than I am, and God, and me. Period. End of story. Nothing wrong with any of you. Don't take anything personally. It has nothing to do with that. And the last thing is speak things that be not. What does it mean? Well, Romans 4.17 says, as it is written, I've made you the father of many nations. Now, God says this to Abraham, who's married to a 90-plus-year-old woman. Yeah, I'm going to be the father of nations. Hello, I got no kids, and I got an old lady wife. Hello, God, hello. What are you going to do? Now, we look back on it because it already happened, and so we go, well, God will just give her whatever. Come on. Think about it in the sense of reality. Hello. Her womb is dead. And she's right behind it. Hallelujah. <laughs> she probably looks at Abraham and goes, oh, come on, really, again? I mean, he does She's 90. Come on, guys. You're married. It's okay. And Abraham is like, 
But God said, but God said, I'm going to have so many kids, it's going to be like a nation. it be like the stars in the heavens. Come on, Sarah. Come on. I don't think that went over very well. Because Sarah got so tired of hearing it, she said, look, take the young girl that's with us. Go sleep with her. That's what happened. She did anything to shut him up. Get off of me. <laughs> See, human nature, when you read the Bible, you've got to read it from a human perspective. Abraham had it going on. Sarah didn't care. <laughs> Hallelujah. Joshua 1 and 8, and this is a great scripture, it says, This book of the law shall not depart from thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate there, they sh thou shalt meditate therein day and night, and seek to do according to all that is written therein. Then, then who's going to make their way prosperous? Read it. What does it say? Then you will have good success. You will make your way prosperous. When we meditate on the word of God, we get built up. We get faith. We get to bless. Abraham was called the father of faith, but did he have a lot of faith? Hello. He took Hagar. How much faith did he have? It was minuscule, guys. Hello. We have the word of God given to us so we can meditate there in day and night. Seek to do what the word of God is telling us to do in the situation, whatever you're facing, and believe God for the impossible. Proverbs 4.20, my son, be attentive to my words, incline your ear to my sayings. Let them not escape from your sight. Keep them within your heart for their life to those who find them and healing to all their flesh. Death and life are in the power of the tongue. And those who love it shall eat the fruit thereof. All these scriptures talk about what? The word of God. <clears throat> when we speak the word of God into our problem, okay, you're facing a decision you have to make in life. Your decision is going to affect you and it's going to affect other people. But you're not really so concerned about the other people. I'm just being real right now, okay? You're more concerned about how it affects you. Okay, so you're about to make this life impacting decision and you're weighing how will this affect me? Well, if you if you learned like I did, I learned, well, you write down all the pros on one side, all the cons on the other side. And then you take, you know, the preponderance of the evidence in what favor it is, pro or con. And that's your decision. Great worldly advice. But somewhere in the mix, where's God? See, I could have very easily, 20-some years ago, when I met my wife at church in Waterbury, I could have very easily just said, shoreline? I'm not going to the shoreline. I don't even like the beach. Why would I do that? But I prayed, and I asked God, and I believed God, and I began to speak things that didn't exist before they would come to pass. I said, God, I'm thanking you. Your perfect will is coming to pass in my life. Now, I was believing we were going to start a church and, you know, we're going to be in a big city. Yeah, Chicago, Detroit, L.A., Miami. No, no, no. Uh, Hartford? No. New Haven? No. God, Middletown? No. God, we're, 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 Shoreline? Old where? Old Saybrook? Where the heck is Old Saybrook? God. It's nowhere. They don't even have 10,000 people in Old Saybrook. Yeah. But I began to speak things that be not as though they were. I said, God, I want to be able to impact people's lives. 
I want to be able to see people's lives changed by the power of the gospel. And my idea and God's idea are two separate things. Mine is grandiose and God's is specific. Mine is all about me and his is all about him. So every decision, see it goes back. Speak to things that be not. Talk with like-minded people. Talk to my pastor. I begin to thank God for the answer. Oh, great, God, thank you. The answer's coming. Here it is. Ah, thank you, God. I'm thanking you. The answer is here. The answer's on its way. You're going to give me the desires of my heart. Praise God. Yeah, old Saybrook. But I was speaking things that be not as though they were. Are you happy with my decision? No, <laughs> I'm really not. Patience, my son. Patience. Remember the first four things we talked about? Remember? I don't even remember. i got to look them up because I lose my thought pretty quickly. But if you do remember, it goes like this. Knowing who God is. Knowing God's intentions for you. Surrendering control over the outcomes. And then waiting. Remember I said waiting is always the hard one. Waiting. I'm still waiting. Uh, no. Uh, <laughs> I've surrendered to God the outcome. And I'm waiting because, see, what we think and what God thinks are always two different things. His ways are higher than our ways. His thoughts higher than our thoughts. But in the end, it will be all that God wanted it to be. In the end, I will have accomplished all that God called for me to do. It may not be what I thought, but it's what he thought. And your life is exactly the same way. So I hope, now there's a lot here, so you can listen to it again. You can go online. You could do that. But I hope you begin to employ these things. Put them in your life because it will help you get through to lay the burdens at the foot of the cross. Because that's really what it's all about. We want to give up what we want and really want to be more in line with what he wants. And that's a hard thing to do on a regular basis. But once we start to do it, we do it once, we do it twice, you do it 10, 12, 20, start doing it. And after a while, you begin to say, yeah, God, you know, you were right. If I was in Chicago, probably would have had some problems, some trouble. Something would have happened. Who knows? The way I talk, somebody might have shot me. I don't know. Who knows? <laughs> But God knows. God knows. So if you're here today watching, listening, and you never made a decision for Jesus Christ, I can, I can tell you this. It all starts there because none of what I talked about today will apply to you unless you're in relationship with him. And God made it easy enough. He said, ABC, admit you're a sinner, believe on my son Jesus Christ, and C, choose to follow me. Again, hard decisions. We all can believe Jesus Christ. We, you know, he lived, died, and rose again. We could admit we're sinners. We could do those. That's pretty simple. But choosing to live for Christ, that's hard. God wants you to, to fulfill your life's mission, your, the goal that he put you on earth for. That means giving up what you want and doing what he wants you to do. That's a choice for you to make. But if you'll do it today... I can't say you'll have a bed of roses and everything will be perfect, but I can tell you this. You'll have an intimate and close relationship beginning with the God of all creation. And my friends, there's nothing greater than that.